Some of them. <clears throat> We've had a lot of people come to uh, our ministry page the last few weeks. I got a notification from Facebook said that I've hit a threshold where now they're pushing it out to more people, which that's exciting. So I didn't know they did. Well, I knew they 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 really don't push a lot of stuff out unless you post a lot so sometimes people wonder why people aren't commenting it's because you're not posting enough so but i've hit a pretty big threshold so i'm excited about that so welcome to our facebook live and those that will be watching later and also on youtube we appreciate you participating in our teaching on sunday mornings and uh i i believe that that you many of you come back often so i believe that you're receiving some food that's helping you and that's what our goal is is to prepare portions for people that may not have ministers teaching this. So uh, we are uh, going through the book of Romans uh, through my translating and, uh, translation and teaching from that. And we've gotten to chapter 8 the last few weeks and we're teaching uh, what is commonly called the greatest chapter in the Bible. And I'm pointing out 38 powerful pillars of truth in that. <clears throat> Pastor Garner, when we met Brother Garner, he taught on seven pillars of, of truth that Leon Stump and other ministers have taught, but in chapter 8, it's just, that is a powerful chapter. Almost every verse, uh, but the majority of the verses have some kind of powerful truth that everybody needs to glean from. And so today we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 5 through 6, so I will go ahead and start that. So Romans 8, 5, people who continue after the prescription of dead animals and bloody sacrifices of, of mindful or mindful of the due-to-be laws. They are unnecessarily trying to produce what they already possess. They are already righteous and one with Father. They think they're appeasing an angry Father. They believe Father wants people to offer these sacrifices for appeasement, but Father does not. Therefore, they live as carnal. Those who live from the resources of their breath of life have an, an awareness full of truth. They are living out of their resource of holy breath for life. And if you read much of my writings or listen to me very much, nobody is carnal and no one has a carnal mind, but we live as carnal. There's a difference there. When the uh, children of Israel were freed from Babylonian captivity and they were going back to rebuild the destroyed city of Jerusalem and the temple, they, the Levites could not prove their lineage because the Babylonians had burned them. Confusion burned our lineage, right? And so the Bible says they were considered as polluted until a priest could stand up with some Urim and Thummim. And Urim and Thummim means light on perfection. So that's what we've all needed all of our life is some kind of minister that would come forth and teach, uh, shine some light on our eternal perfection because most of them revealed our internal impureness, if you would. And so powerful pillar of truth number one, the power... When you look up the word power in the Bible, it's always dunamis. So the power of you as a living soul and contact with your source, which is the divine mind, releases perfection and life and peace. There is something about constant contact with Father. We are in constant contact because we have an awareness, Father, but we're not necessarily aware that we're in constant contact. We're not conscious of that. Does that make sense? And so what we want to do is we want to be consciously in contact with Father where we hear Father speak to us and where we live and move and have our being by what we hear from our Father. So a truth, will, uh, a truth we all need to understand is that the first race of mankind, Adam, and all the other races after the first race are all the same. You know, some people think, well, the first race was different than the last race. And, but we're all the same. We're all sons and we're all daughters of God. And we all have the very life of God in, in us, no matter what we do or what we don't do. We can be what we would call really, really bad or what we would call really, really good, but we're still right wise with Father. And that's what the word righteous means. <clears throat> so they, we, and everyone born after us are living souls. And that's what I want to talk about today. A living soul. What is a living soul? Who are we really? Are we a spirit, soul, and a body? No, we're not. We used to think we were, but we're not. And so, according to the transla translators of Paul's writings, uh, Paul wrote to the community of believers at Corinth, and he says, As so it is written, 
the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, last Adam, was made a quickening spirit. So in that King James Version, if you would, <clears throat> and that's 1 Corinthians 15, 45, right there shows a difference, right? It makes us like we're different than the first man. But we're not. We're not any difference except our awareness has changed. Some people are still living as the first man, very carnal, very much into self-works and self-efforts, following the law of doing to be. And when you do that, what do you do? You self-condemn yourself. So we don't say I'm naked, but we, what do we say? I'm a sinner. Same thing. And so a more accurate understanding <clears throat> of Paul's statement is in this way, even so, it is written, the first species, or we could say race, of man, Adam, was caused to be holy breath, and to the farthest point, or the uttermost, the same breath of holy breath continues to vitalize and keep mankind alive. So it never changed. There was no change at all. And, and literally, you can be a non-believer, and you can be totally ignorant to truth, but you have the breath of God in you, and that breath of God in you is working in you, Right? Because if you, if, you're, if you were cut off from your source, then you would cease to exist. But it, capital I-T, it is not being released or it has not been allowed. The, John said, let the same mind be in you, the divine mind. So we had to let it, right? Because Father's not going to push himself on anybody, if I could say it that way. So the phrase was made was added by the translators. It wasn't there in the original. You can see 9999 there, which means added by the translators. So the translators had no concept of eternity whatsoever. So they used the great, uh, Greek word, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-S, meaning the furthest or the final point. So God's life is there for eternity because there is no final point. The only time we talk about uh, uh, when we talk about end, that's, that means when you come to the point that you're fully aware of who you are. The end of all the confusion. And many people, I believe, are, are there for most part of our lives. We're not living out of confusion. We're not feeding on confusion. We're letting it go because we saw that it did nothing for us. So <clears throat> the word so, I looked this up yesterday. It's mentioned 458 times in the King James Version. And something said that often draws one to conclude the subject is so is essential and it needs to be searched out and we need to understand it. Because most people, you can ask them, what is a soul? And they can't understand that. They, they think the soul is different than spirit. We were taught that we, we, uh, we are spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body, and our soul needs to be saved. We were taught that our soul is our mind, our will, and emotions. Did y'all ever hear that? And so that's a doctrine that was taught and put in our Bibles, and it's the furthest of the, from, of the truth. So I found two synonyms for the English word so that I like, and their spirit and their essence. So would you say your soul and spirit are the same thing? It is. It's the very same thing. There is no difference. So we know the word spirit is a Latin word, so the, the, therefore spirit could not be in the original text. So the true meaning is essence. The true meaning is source and uh, our soul is one with father right father is our source so our our soul our soul is the source of our life it's who we are we are one and so the meaning of essence is is the is is called the intrinsic nature or indispensable quality of a person that determines their character so when we let that same mind be in us then we function out of that true character that Father created us to be. We function out of Father's character, and Jesus came to show us Father's character. He said, I don't say anything that the Father doesn't say. I don't hear the Father say. I don't do anything that I don't see the Father do. So he functioned perfectly out of the character of Father. And that's why so many people thought that Jesus was God all by himself. They, they, didn't, they didn't see a God or source of the universe, but they, they, they were, we were taught that Jesus was God. And Jesus, the only way Jesus was God was he was God embodied, just like you and I are God embodied. And if we don't know that, then we put Jesus above us. And again, that's where the Trinity doctrine came from, where we're lowly and we can't even touch them or be like them. So in the old Outlook and Perception books, and I have this in y'all's notes to follow if you want to, most mention, mentions of the word so carry the same meaning. 
uh, I first found Hebrews, uh, the, the uh, Hebrew number 5315, and it's nefesh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H, and it means properly breathing. And then the mefesh comes from the Hebrew 5314, and I forgot to type that word in there, but it means to breathe or to be breathed upon. Okay? And then the fesh also can be used as refresh oneself. Physically, when we take a breath, what are we doing? We're refreshing ourselves. Uh, I have this situation, uh, and I don't know why, but when I focus on things a lot, when I'm studying or I'm watching TV, I forget to breathe. Do you do that? And so I had to go, <gasps> and what am I doing? I'm refreshing myself. I'm getting that oxygen in that I need. But more importantly, the Father, the breath of Father ref eternally refreshes us. So then we find this Greek word, suke, which we've all heard about, P-S-U-C-H-E, and again, it means breathe. And then next we find sukho, and it means to breathe gently. And I I'm getting somewhere here because this next part I really enjoy. So another root word for so is the Greek word 5591. I can't even begin to pronounce it. I would say suchikos, but it's P-S-U-C-H-I-K-O-S, and the meaning is sensitive. You, you see where this is coming? It's sensitive. <clears throat> and it comes from 4152, which is P-N-E-U-M-A-T-I-K-O-S. And it literally says to be non-carnal or a divine supernatural, which is in higher nature, rather than sukuls, which means just to be physical. That's what it says when you, when you look in there. And it, again, it amazes me that these supposedly very intelligent scholars did not bring this out and show this to people. Because this is literally the very breath of God makes us non-carnal in our understanding. The very breath of God, it's not just physical. It's not living out of, uh, out of a lower realm awareness. It's living out of who we really are. And so we know if we do not have breath, what happens? Our body dies, right? Uh, as I had mentioned several times over the last 10 months, when my heart stopped after surgery, I quit breathing. And when I quit breathing, my heart stopped. And a young lady came in and told me later on, she said, I breathed breath into you. And when she breathed breath into me, and then they shocked me with the paddles and I came back to life. But if I wasn't breathing, it wouldn't matter what they did to my heart, right? There had to be oxygen. That's why they tell you when somebody's going to cardiac arrest, the first thing you start doing is pumping their heart. Not, not really breathe. They tell people not to really do that anymore, but to pump in their heart. And what do you call that? Resuscitation or whatever. And so breath and breathing are vital. I can't just take in, right? Because if I just take in and I don't breathe out, then there's no more room for fresh breath to come to me. So breath and breathing, breathing are, are vital, vital to our life. And uh, if I hadn't had oxygen, then I would have suffered brain damage. <laughs> I'm getting somewhere here. Because if, we don't, if we're not aware of the breath of God functioning in us, then we have great confusion in our brain. Mm -hmm. We have great confusion in our awareness. And we, I think we have not been fed the true breath of life teaching that we needed to. And that's why people are walking around in confusion and all kinds of stuff is going on in our bodies because of it. So it's vital to us. It's crucial to us. And uh, it helps the oxygen helps us uh, with our physical body. But the breath of God helps us with our who we really are, which we are spiritual. We're not just physical. We, and I'll deal with this later on today. But we we see ourselves as physical and we need to change our perception. Did y'all see that picture I put on Facebook of that apple with the mirror? That was, that was a really great uh, example of perception, how you see things. It, it, uh, they, somebody had put a mirror up behind an apple and it was beautiful, but on this side it was half eaten or more. But when you took the picture, you saw both and it was like, what do you see? And so our perfection, uh, you know, so literally I saw a beautiful apple. I didn't focus on the other side of that apple. And so uh, my daughter sent that to me, I think. <clears throat> so in my past understanding, again, I thought we were a three-part being. 
and that we needed to get our souls saved. And so we constantly tried to do that. And that was reinforced by the King James saying that Paul said, don't be conformed to this world anymore, but be you transformed by the renewing of the mind. So what, what did you think renewing the mind meant? Read, study, yes, all right? Memorize, Change your mind. People talk about that still all the time. People that listen to Kay and I, huh? turn and go the other way we thought all of, but the truth is is our mind is the divine mind we only have one mind so it's our brain it's our thoughts our thoughts need to change and you you don't have to say well i'm going to practice this for 10 weeks and say i'm holy i'm holy i'm holy it, it, it's you feed on truth you feed on truth and the truth is what does what it makes you free it, it causes you to experience your freedom from all that confusion that's come to us and so we know that we are a living soul, just like our Father is one. We're not th a three-part being. And I know a lot of people have a hard time with this. The college I come, uh, have, have a teaching in, you know, a lot of them believe in a trinity, and that's all right. I mean, you know, if you want to believe in something, I'm not trying to make you not believe in it. But if you're a follower of what we're teaching, and, and you, you know what we're teaching is truth, and you've got to understand that, because as long as you believe in a three-part a trinity then you believe they're way up here somewhere they're greater than you and we can never be like father and all through scripture it says we're the face of god all through scripture i can show you where we live in god's sight we live as the plural of god you once you translate what they did to it then you find the truth who we are and jesus knew that because what did he say if you've seen me you've seen the father <clears throat> so the lord our father is one meaning the self-existent one are eternal and exist at all times world without end so literally father exists in us when he when moses said who shall i say sent me he didn't say i am that i am he said i exist that i exist did he exist in pharaoh yes he, he exists in everyone because there is no other source and god is the source of all things so everywhere you look you see father you see father in the sky, the art, the beautiful art in the sky, you see farther in the trees, and you see the very image of God's breath in mankind. So I like this, what I found. Uh, the word one means united. It's E-C-H-D, or to unify. So Father unifies us. Father is not a physical being who can separate from us. Father is our essence, our inner and outer life both. And so some synonyms for unify are merge, unite, combine, and join together as one. When did that happen? When Father formed us in our mother's womb. When that spark of light entered into the, my egg. When my dad penetrated my, wife, my mother with sperm, it had, a, had life in it. That's what I believe because you can see that explosion the minute the sperm hits the egg. And I believe that's when the life of God hits that egg and causes it to be everything it's supposed to be. So we are all one, and we, but we manifest in unique expressions. We don't look alike. We don't, we don't talk alike. We don't, we don't do, if we all did the same thing and looked alike, it would be pretty boring, wouldn't it? Yes. But we, we are different expressions, and that shows you how great our Father is. That our Father has an idea for each one of us to fulfill our personal expression and our personal path and our personal ministry and our personal talent, whatever it is that's put in us and that's put into our DNA. And so uh, I'm not saying that we are not physical bodies, like some people say, this is just a figment of your imagination. We are physical bodies, but the truth is that we've got to understand we don't have to live physically minded. We don't have to live mortally minded. Mortally minded is what? Liable to die. Physical minded is just, I'm just a human. I'm just a man. Remember that song that we all used to sing, a lot of people sing all the time. We see ourselves more than just skin and bones, or as uh, the Bible says, flesh and bones. We, we see the full glory of God. Uh, maybe it's energy. Uh, the movie The Shack, when Mac went to see uh, his dad, he didn't know he was going to see his dad, but when he looked out in that field, he was just saw energy everywhere, and you could tell it was people that had gone on, and then dad slowed down the visibility so he could have some time with his dad. So the Bible... Uh, 
talks a lot, uh, reveals, uh, reveals a lot about energy. We just don't see the true words. But I believe if we could see ourselves with our single eye, we would see who we really are. And we would see that everybody's beautiful. They just have different characters. They have different personalities. They have different awarenesses. So our soul, who we are, is not carnal. Our soul does not need to get saved, right? The word save means rescue. That's all it means is rescue. So I didn't need to be rescued from Father God, nor did you, nor does anybody else. But one thing that needs to be rescued is my awareness. And that's what we're doing. And that's what Father is doing today through a group of people that's finally said enough. I can't take this anymore. There's got to be something more. There's got to be something better. And when you get to that place, what you're doing is you're questioning your theology. When you start questioning your, th your theology, Father's right there to begin to bring answers to you. And Paul, what I like about how Father does to me, and I've heard other people say this, is I, my, in my thought, I ask a question. It just comes. It's like, I wonder about this. And I know that's Father, and I know Father is getting ready to give me the answer. Because when I wonder, when I respond, I go to my computer, or I'm sitting at my computer, and I immediately begin to search. And I immediately hear a verse, or I hear, a, I, I hear go to the internet and search a word, and, uh, or, or I'll remember something that I wrote 20 years ago, and it's still on my computer, and I go back and I go, oh, that's what that means. And that's how Father speaks to us. But you have to be ready to question your theology, and not everybody's ready for that. And I'm looking forward for everybody to get there. So what, what do we see when we, when, we, uh, when we look with our single eye, when we look at people, when we see the world? The Bible says the whole earth is filled with God's glory. I've heard people say the Bible says the whole earth is going to be filled with God's glory, but it actually says the whole earth is filled with God's glory. That's us. That's creation. Everything that's created, everything that we can see and we don't see right now is the glory of God. Something amazes me, not all the time, but quite often I, like to, I watch uh, documentaries about the ocean and they're always coming up with a new creature that nobody's ever seen before. And they go down in the depths of the ocean. And I mean, it's amazing the things they see. And I just think, how can that be? Where did that come from? It came from Father. But I'm telling you what, there's no creature on planet Earth that's more beautiful than you and I. When God wanted to form something that was the exact image of Father, He made man and He made woman. And in Genesis, it really says, God created man to recreate Oh, God created man, male and female, to recreate him. That's pretty powerful. And I'm saying him, but there is no gender. So we could just say recreate God or recreate Father. And so uh, I, I pointed out in, in the last chapter uh, that we taught that there's some, there were some words and there were some names in the Old Outlook books that meant servant-minded. And so most of us all of our life we felt like we were serving God uh, I know churches that teach their people to work in different situations in the church to raise money or whatever and they tell them you're serving God right and so when you live with that servant minded then can you see yourself as one with the father you can't and literally you become mortal minded so having a servant uh, attitude is likened to a mortal perspective and again a liable to die and also liable to be punished. Correct? And how many grew up that way? Always wondered, well, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, so I'm going to get punished. And we would begin to blame our, our, uh, our, uh, trying to think what? There's a word I'm trying to think of. Sin means, miss the mark. To blame our mark missing on, or give credit to our mark missing for, losing their job, or your car breaking down, or your child gets sick, or even worse, your child dying. The reason my child died is because I didn't pay my tithe. That, I've heard that. And so we don't want to be that way. Our soul, who we are, is not carnal. Yet we can live a, in a carnal mindset, and we present ourselves in that same manner. And, you know, I can prove it to you because I've read lots of posts and I've had lots of people say, well, I don't know about you, 
but or I don't the, the last one was I don't know I don't know about that Roy Richmond guy, but I am human and I'll be human the rest of my life. They they fight to be that way. And then we're taught in churches again that we're carnal by saying you're still a sinner. And then that leaves you feeling guilty all the time. And you're always trying to please God. And Lord, I hope I've, I've asked you to forgive me for that last sin just before I die. Yeah. Right? As my mama used to say, when somebody died in a car wreck or died somewhere, she said, man, I hope they said the name Jesus. And I, you know... <laughs> Yes. Everything I did that I didn't know I did. Yeah. So there's a symbolical meaning of the Israelites separating themselves in Scripture from foreign wives and children. And I'm not sure that Moses was told by God to do that, but I do believe it's a great picture of separating ourselves from mixed thoughts, separating ourselves from confusion. And I've told you all before, uh, many years ago I was sleeping and I heard a voice above me three times, and it got louder and louder until I got up, calling all called out ones. Very definite, very strong. And I finally woke up and knew it was Father, and I came in and wrote about 10 pages about being called out. And, there, and the Father spoke to me, there's two different types of people being called out today. There are people that are in religious systems that they can learn, this person can learn, and they can find a messenger that'll teach them, and they'll be able to share it, and they will embrace it, and so they stay there. But then there are some that where they're at will never embrace it, and they're to come completely out. And only you can know that. Nobody can tell you yourself. But we do have to separate ourselves from that. So if you're feeding on truth during the week, and then on Sunday and Wednesday and revival time, you're feeding on the lie, then you've got a mixture of thoughts in there, and there's a war going on all the time. Mm -hmm. And the problem is the lie is more familiar than the truth, yes. right? I've had people come hear me teach in my fellowships and I've had them come when I traveled some and they would say, amen, 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 amen. But then later on, I would hear them say completely opposite of what they said amen to. And you know what the word amen means? <coughs> let it be unto me. That's what it means, it means let it be unto me. And so it's very important for us to separate ourselves from mixed thoughts. Uh, I've thrown away a lot of books. Uh, I had a library of 850, most of them commentaries, and I gave most of them away. I wish I would have just burned them all, to tell you the truth. But I, I finally quit reading that. Uh, I've read all of Watchman E's books, all the Wit Witness Lee's books. I, I've read all kinds of commentaries, tons of them. But what I got was a bunch of mixture of thoughts. One person said one thing, Another person said another thing. And that's why I finally got tired of going to what we called conferences because there would be five or six preachers and every one of them would contradict the other one. I love conferences because you get to meet people, but it needs to be teachers that are like-minded, that understand what they're saying, what they understand each other and they believe what each other is teaching. That's when it's going to change people's lives. So these thoughts again... Uh, give us a sense of separation. The Apostle Paul said that we were alienated from God where? In our awareness. It didn't say mind, but in our awareness. So Father uh, called out a man named Abram, and we know him as Abraham, but he called out Abraham to leave his father, Terah, uh, behind when he started learning about Father. He was going to go on a spiritual journey, and Father had a plan for Abraham, or Abram at that time, and his leaving father behind pictures the same thing as leaving mixed thoughts. Do any of you know anything about Terah very much? A lot of people don't. The Terah, also spelled Terach, T-E-R-A-C-H, was the father of Abram. He was the first patriarch of the Jewish nation, and he was the leader of worship of idols, the moon god, Moloch, and others. He, and they, they came out of the ur -Kaldes. And that's so he was the leader of that. And he raised his family in a, a, dollar, a dollar to a city called Haran, H-A-R-A-N. So Abram did not need those hindrances of his dad. And father knew that. But guess what he did? He brought him anyways. Because it's just kind of hard to let go of your dad, isn't it? You know, 
I was talking to Kay about that, but you know, there's a scripture that said we must give up father, mother, brother, and sister for the gospel state. That doesn't mean they're not my parents anymore. That doesn't mean I'm going to move away from them or not even see them. But it means I'm not going to let what they believe influence me. And Father knew if he brought Taryn with him, he would influence everybody that was with him. And that's why Father asked him not to do that. So he, 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 he was going on this spiritual journey, and the spiritual journey is an awakening. That's what we all need to go on. And so we need to leave behind that which traduces us and that which hinders us. And the biggest problem with Paul was the people that he was teaching. And the biggest problem with Jesus is the leaders that were around them were indoctrinated in the law of doing to be. And so they were traducers. They were the devil, right? It means traducer, hinder. So they were the devil. They were the traducer to Jesus. And so much so that Jesus could not impart the spiritual truths that he wanted to. He tried, but the people he came to were bankrupt. The people he came to were in bondage to religiosity, and they only wanted what he had to give them, but not what he had to share with them. I believe some did, but you don't see much recorded in the scripture. Later on, when you go to the book of Acts, you begin to see where the disciples knew more and more and more, and they did a lot of supernatural things that we really haven't been taught about much. And one of these days, hopefully, I'll be able to teach from Acts, because I think that would be a, a good teaching to go through. So... The inner conception in us, our soul, a father, is the only source of our being. And it brings to pass in our consciousness this expression of spiritual dunamis, spiritual power. We are powerful people. We've got to believe that. I'm not weak. I'm not mentally ill. I'm not who I really am. I'm not diseased. Who I really am, I don't have a heart problem. Who I really am, I don't have a liver problem. And those are things that we really need to focus on. And it's not name it and claim it. It's just changing our awareness. Because quite often, and right now it's happening, <laughs> I get these extra heartbeats and it, they speak differently to me. But I keep saying, Father, this does not belong to me. And I call forth and release your, your supernatural restorative power that's going to heal what's going on in my heart. And I'm believing for that. And so we have the power and the ability to do all things. Anything Father directs us to do, we can do that. And I, I, I'm on two different pages, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and amyloidosis pages, and I get to share a lot of truth with some of them. I'm not there to preach to them, but I'll write sometimes, I'm praying and I'm believing that we will have doctors very soon that will tap in to the divine knowledge of our Creator, and that they will learn ways to heal people, but not only just heal us, to eradicate the problem. I'm believing that. And so people need to hear that because they're, they're desperate. They're tired of the medicines. There's always another medicine and always another medicine, and they bring problems. And they're, they're temporal. I'm not saying don't take your medicine. I take mine. But I know they're temporal. I know they're, they're not that which is perfect. And that which is perfect is releasing the very dunamis power of God in my being. So Philippians 4.13 says, We can do all things through contact with Father, our strength and source. The word Christ literally it should be contact, in my opinion. And that's how it works. it's translated that way. So we, uh, we, I can also say it this way. We are strengthened, bound fast, girded and made firm by the dunamis power of our Father in us. Human-minded strength does not bring forth anything of permanence. That's how I translate that verse. And it's true, isn't it? Yes. Nothing of permanence. You can take a person that's whatever it is they've got and, and, and short of just an absolute spiritual miracle taking place, it's just something that often gets worse and worse and worse. Huh? Temporary. Temporary. It's temporary. And I've seen a lot of people come out of the hospital, resurrected from a heart attack, and go home and die with cancer. Didn't that happen to your hubby? Came, was resurrected. I mean, that, they, they, they knew what to do. They did a bypass, and he, they, he was fine. But then just how many months later? That wasn't too long, was it? No, it was no. So healings are great. I could use a healing right now. But I'd rather, I, what I want is permanence where I don't get that anymore. It's just like I say, winning the lottery is great, 
but just never needing money the rest of your life is even better knowing that you have a source that is always going to be there when you when it's required so i don't want to get off my track here but we don't want human-minded strength and that's that's what a lot of people do they give you 10 steps how to get well or how to pray the perfect prayer there's always that and that's a human-minded that to me that's a carnal minded all those different steps because it just usually doesn't work I found uh, a woman, uh, and you guys all should know her name. You know who Abishag was, Donna? Abishag. Ag Abishag. It's a name you wouldn't want to be named. That was a that was a young lady that uh, married David and and King David, and and Abishag. and nurtured to him and ministered to him. Abigail. No, but there's an Abishag, and her name means father of error, father of wandering, and father of ignorance. Isn't that interesting? So Abishag was a beautiful Shunammite woman, and she did minister to David in his older age. But the meaning of her name could easily fit Terah, Abram's father. The importance of Abishag with her history here is representative of the ignorant, error, limited belief that spiritually awakened man holds regarding life. Because we have been ignorant, have we not? Ignorant to father. Ignorant, ignorant just means no understanding. We've been ignorant in the ways of father. We've been made ignorant by false belief systems, even though we are spiritual. Everybody is spiritual. Everybody has the life of God in them. So life is divine and its source is father. And again, it does not emanate from carnal religious works like we used to do. I can't fast enough to get the life of God in me. I already have it. I can't do anything physically or rules to try to rise up to who I am. I must hear the truth, believe the truth, and embrace the truth. And you can, you'll feel it. You'll experience it right then. So life is divine to us, and we got to understand that it's not a psychic, it's not a mental, mental quality, and, and it doesn't spring from physical. And, and the old outlook books, it says it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by spirit, or it's by the breath of God. When we let the breath of God flow through us and function in us. And so another wife of David is A-B-I-T-A-L, Abitel. Her name means father of dew, D-E-W, father of dew, father of freshness, and my father is be doing freshness, which is interesting. But her name allegorically speaks of the idea by so and the vitalizing and refreshing of one's consciousness and this inner awareness begins to come up of father or source. And the idea here is it brings harmony, it brings peace to our consciousness, and we receive, if you would, the dews of Father's holy breath, like dew. But when does dew come? Do, 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 you, do you get up in the morning after a stormy night and wind blowing and hell and all that kind of stuff? Do you see dew on the ground there? You don't. It only comes on a quiet night, quiet and calm night. And dew only falls that way. So hence, be still and know that I exist. And when we, when we do that and we're calm and quiet, we enter into rest, then we are allowing the very breath of God to flow through us. We're allowing truth to penetrate us from our divine mind. And we can hear Father's voice. And when we hear Father's voice, we hear, in a sense, this is the way, walk you in it. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just rest. I have many times that people have come down for prayer in church as pastors should have said, wait a minute, calm down a minute. Because have you ever, have you ever heard anybody praying for a need, particularly in a charismatic church that we grew up in? There's a lot of screaming. There's a lot of hollering. My pastor said that we should demand of God, literally demand God because God owes it to us. That's pretty arrogant, isn't it? So this calm and quiet state symbolizes this inner consciousness of spiritual life as being directive and the controlling power that lifts all the life and it causes the life to begin to radiate through your entire being. Every cell of your body, life is there, but it needs to be released because there is a hindrance. And that hindrance is what we believe or what we don't believe. 
you know, some people could come hear this and walk out and say, I don't believe that. Well, then you're not going to experience it. And literally, you need to believe, and then you'll see. You know, most people, uh, Paul, say seeing is believing. You ever heard that? But that's not really true. It's believing is seeing. Because I can love you, but if you don't see my love for you, you can say, Roy doesn't love me. But the truth is, I do love you. And I've, I've heard people say that a minister, you know, my pastor doesn't love me because he never comes and shakes hands with me after church or anything. Well, do you not realize that you had 20 visitors there that he needs to see? Is that proof that he loves you just because he shakes your hand? And that's the, the little lies that get up in there and affect people's lives and destroy relationships. Another one is God doesn't love me because he's never done anything for me. I've heard people say that. I've talked to people that said, what has Father ever done for me? You know, and of course, I didn't know what I know now, but I said, well, he sent his son to die for you. You know, that's, that's how I did that. But people need to understand this, that Father is the Father of all, and we have Father in us, and there's only one man, there's no gender implied, there's only one man, we are all one, again, like I said earlier, with many expressions. So man is holy breath. That's what soul is. Soul is holy breath. So if anybody ever asks you or try to tell you that your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions, get this video on Facebook, get this text, and sit and go over it with them and help them understand. Because we're not a soul and a spirit and a body. We're not a three-part being. We, we are life and we are substance. And we, we're, we, we know, as the Father of all, we know holy breath and we know Father intimately. And we should know Father intimately. We should, we're not afraid of Father anymore. So this is the only one man. And uh, man is the absolute, if you would, or the unconditioned breath of God. There's no conditions to it. We don't have to say something or a certain type of prayer or do a certain type of work to earn anything because we already are who we are. Like my children, they don't have to do anything to become Roy and Donna Richmond's child, do they? They already are, you know, so there's also one man uh, that's the same man throughout generations and generations and generations. As I said earlier, the man, the first race of man the day, uh, in the beginning, and there really is no beginning because it's eternity, but the, the man has always been the same, but they express themselves differently. In the world today, we have all different, what we call races, but all it is is different colors of skin and different languages and raised in different places. But there are brothers, there are sisters, we're one. And so we are all then termed so. We lack nothing whatsoever but awareness. That's all we lack. Nothing but awareness. We haven't known who we are. So what we're doing is we're continually seeking the truth that makes us experience this, where this pure breath of life breathes in the idea that God has for mankind and it has for us. And Jesus told his disciples he would converse with the Father, which that's what the word prayer means, is converse, uh, converse with the Father, and that Father would send more comforter teachers to, to, to be equipped so they could do what he did. He didn't say, I'm going to go away and I'm going to ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit. That's what we were taught, isn't it? He did not do that because Spirit was already there. Breath was already there. Everybody already had the breath of God. And so he said, they're going to explain to you what I try to explain to you, and they're going to, show, going to show you the way. When Jesus said, I am the way, he wasn't saying, you, you, I'm, the, I'm the only way to get to God. He was saying, I'm the way, I'm showing you how to live that kind of life. I'm showing you how to live out of who you are. I'm, I'm exemplifying that for you, is what he said. And we can do that in many areas of, my, of our life. I can show you some ways that you can believe about your eternal supply. I, we've got a whole chapter in Living Out of Our Spiritual Resources that teaches about our, our spiritual resources and our eternal supply, how we really lack nothing whatsoever. And I have that understanding financially. Other people have that understanding physically. But I believe there's a group of people coming together that we're going to be able to share with people how to live in what I call the no-need realm. I need nothing whatsoever. I really don't need it. I don't need a healing because God, my health is in me. I just need to let that flow through me. And so 
So this is what he said. He said, these comforter teachers will show you the way to live and will not speak or give glory to themselves. But whatsoever they hear, they will communicate and whatsoever uh, things need to appear, they will show you. That, that's literally what Jesus said to his disciples. And that needs to be heard because many ministry today glorify themselves, do they not? And they want you to follow them and almost worship them. And people begin to worship their leaders. And scripture says that we're not to do that. Even Jesus said to John, when John bowed down to him in the revelation, he said, don't bow to me, worship the Father. Because he was here to point people to the Father. I'm here to point people to the Father. And yes, listen to what Jesus taught. And yes, listen to what John taught. I see a lot of people on, on Facebook uh, speaking against Paul. And they don't understand why people like me preach from preach Paul's writings. Well, the reason they're doing that is because they're reading a really ill-translated version of what he said. A lot of women don't like Paul because they think he said that the woman keeps silent, but that's not what it says. I don't have that memorized, but I have it in Scripture. But he didn't say that. It's, it's basically a, a picture of the, the feminine part of our, our being, the left side of his cake closet. That needs to be silent, and we need to listen to the right side of our brain, which is the spirit. It's the, it's our, it's the voice that's where Father, Father speaks to us and out of that. <clears throat> so these messengers, who are they? Well, some have left their body and gone on into the spirit realm. Is that, that's what we call it, the spiritual realm or whatever. But they can step in and out of that realm when it's needed. And that would be uh, Michael and that would be Gabriel. Both of them were men. It says, when you look it up, it says men. It doesn't say angels. And they had a message for Mary and, and had a message for Daniel. Uh, I had one step out of that realm and spoke to me in Minnesota. I've talked about it before and I won't do that, but I've had many experiences like that. Then some are still alive and still in their bodies, like me, like Kay Fairchild, like other people. You guys have been equipped to be messengers. I know you are. And uh, we've got to be willing to listen to them because the Bible says we entertain messengers unaware. You know, it says angels, but it's messengers. And sometimes we go into the presence of people's lives and they've got a word for us, but we won't listen to them because we don't like that person. <laughs> it, no, nothing said you had to like them. You let personality interfere. You what? You let personality Yes, interfere. let personalities interfere. And that happens. And, and I've, I've been in places where I, I, I just thought, not prideful, I promise you, I wouldn't have been prideful about myself, but I was never allowed to speak, and everything that was coming out of the preacher's mouths were carnal. And I just thought, and I literally I kind of heard it, they don't know who they're in the presence of. Because I could have got up, or Kay Fairchild could have got up, or other messengers that are around those people could stand up and give them words that would help those people, instead of hearing the same thing over and over and over and over. Is that hard? <laughs> I don't, I, and I'm, I'm not being prideful about that. I'm just saying we need to realize that we entertain messengers unaware and we need to start tuning in to our, our ear to hear and, and, and sense the vibration, if you would, and know, hey, there's somebody here I need to listen to. This thing that this person's telling me, I need to listen to that. I talked to a, a friend's wife the other day and one of her relatives she's taken care of has uh, got dementia, I guess, and get, beginning to get a little mean. And it's, if you've ever had to do that, it's very hard. My mom went through that, and it was very hard because they attack you. You know, you had to sell their home. Next thing you know, they're saying, you stole my money. You took my house away from me. And you're wore out tired because you've got to take care of them 24 hours a day, and you begin to defend yourself. And what I told her, I said, the best thing you can do, and I learned this from a counselor, uh, or, or actually a rest home, is say, I'm sorry, Daddy, you're right, and forgive me. Because I love you. And that's it. And it helps them. But because they, they'll never agree with you. They can't understand it whatsoever. So I don't know why I said that, but it had something to do with what I said before that. <laughs> but sometimes we have to do that with people that uh, we're trying to share something to, with. And they fight us and we just say, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. A lot of that's prideful. 
pridefulness too, because people that are trying to give a message are proud of what they believe. Right. If they believe in themselves. They don't ever stop to think that they could be wrong. That it could be not absolutely mm -hmm. correct. All right. They're defending the lie that they believe. But but I but also I, I've said this before and I've tried to walk this way. I try not to answer people's questions or tell them something unless they're asking the question. Right. Or I sense, mm -hmm. and I do that a lot, I sense that they can hear. That happens at Walmart, that happens at gas stations, that happens at restaurants, that happens at a lot of places. And I've never one time said a truth to somebody like that that they got upset about it. And it's usually just God you, loves you, you know, mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or you're holy, you were born holy but or whatever. If Right. If you try to share something, you know, non non religious, but the fact that Father does love us each and every one differently. Yeah, I promise you, my car tag, "You are holy," offends a lot of people. Really? <laughs> yeah. They're believing the wrong thing, and so uh, from the day that Jesus left Jerusalem, there were many, many comforter messengers appearing, and it happened right then. And some uh, of them are, I'd rather say more of them are needed. There's a lot of people that need a comforter message in their, in their life. And I can't go to your world, but you're in your world. So I think one of the greatest things to do if you're learning these things is say, Father, here I am, send me. Well, do you have to learn everything that I've been studying since I was 35 years old? No. You can take what you learned today and you can and believe and say, Father, here I am, send me. And somebody might show up in your life and often does that needs that exact truth shared with them. And if you can't explain it real well, just say, you know what? I was sitting Sunday and my pastor said this and it was awesome. Can I share it with you? And it applies to their situation. And just start that way. And you would, won't believe how more and more will come because you already know everything that I'm teaching and you already know everything that I'm going to teach and you already know everything that I've started teaching when I went, <clears throat> went after truth. Would you agree with that? Yeah. It's all there. I, I put in my books now and I have for quite a while. I do not copyright my contents of my book. I copyright my book because I designed the label and I don't want uh, people taking that and adding to it and publishing. it. But I, I, I say everything I teach today is from what I study. I'm learning things from Jesus. I'm learning things from Paul. I'm learning things from ancient writers. And so this is not mine. It all comes from Father. And anybody that says, I got this on my own, they're deceiving themselves, right? It's all placed into our awareness. So I'm going to close pretty quick here. But I assure you, our living soul, again, is more powerful than most people know. We are other than physical. And what word means other than physical? Supernatural. Our metaphysical. Metaphysical means other than physical. And so there's dictionaries out there, old ones called metaphysical, and it means other than, other than physical. But a lot of them have some stuff that's not correct, and some have stuff that is correct, so I don't always recommend people reading them. You know, I have one, and I can wade through it because of what I know, and I can say, no, this isn't right, this isn't right. But they were seeking to have a truth that's other than physical, and that's what we need. I don't want to go to a church that only preaches physical understanding because you get very little help there. Yes, you get friends, and you have events, and, it's, and I miss all that. I, I desperately miss going to church with 30, 40, 50 people and having their lunches and doing things with them. But I don't miss what we had to teach to keep them. Does that make sense? The crowd doesn't want to hear this kind of stuff, but they will. And there's a lot of people that do around the world. So this powerful pillar of truth, number five, the power of you as a living soul and in contact with your source, releasing perfection in life and peace is vital to all people. Our soul is I exist. The same in character as the divine mind. You can literally say, I exist. Because you do. You exist. I exist. Who are you? I, well, you, don't, you don't want to go out there and tell your doctor that because <laughs> they might tell you you need to go to psychology, but you need to know 
that you exist as, as, as a son of God. And uh, when, you, when you look at my body, you should see a spiritualized body. You should see me as who I really am by faith. You know, I'm not just saying you're going to just start doing that, but just say, Father, by faith, I see Pastor Roy as a spiritual body. I see Pastor Roy whole. And I say the same thing about you guys. I see you whole. When I think about you, I converse with Father over all of you. I thank God that you guys are coming. And I just say, Father, I see them whole. I see them uh, grabbing hold of what we're teaching quickly and understanding it so they can go forth and feed it to their world bring portions to people that have none. So what is our body? Well, we are the garden of Genesis 28. The garden of Eden, that's who we are. The garden of Eden, and where all things are possible. Everything is possible. So we must grasp this ideas of the absolute, the unrelated, the, and to an unlimited degree where we realize there's nothing impossible for us. Again, the Bible says, you can do all things through contact with Father that strengthens you. If you want to say Christ and you believe Jesus is in you, you know, that's where your awareness is. That's fine. But realize you can do all things. But the contact, it to, makes so much sense to me because all my lights can be turned on through contact with the electrical company. Right? That box is not the, the, the source, but there's an OG&E plant somewhere around here that's generating electricity. And it's got to be in contact with that. I'm not your source. Now, I'm your source of what you're learning right now, but I'm not your source that causes you to understand and be aware because the very divine mind of our Father makes you understand. It, it, it enlarges it and causes this to grow in your understanding. So when our soul touches both the inner conscious thoughts from which it receives direct inspiration and the external will, uh, uh, world, it receives impressions, if you would. It receives understanding. So as man expresses the original purity, then their soul begins to shine like light and people say, what is it about you? There's something different about you. People will begin to be attracted to you. I've told this story over and over, but years ago, I went to Bass Pro Shop to get my daughter a present and I was walking by a family, this lady and a man, two children. And as we walked, the lady and I fixed eyes on each other and she turned, as we passed, she turned and I turned and I looked at her. And we walked probably about 10 or 15 foot and stopped and turned back around and came to each other. And the husband just obediently followed. He was probably going to protect her or something. <laughs> but she said, do I know you? I said, well, you look really familiar to me. Like I, that I know, I know you. And I said, where do you live? She said, we live in Duncan, Oklahoma. And we never could figure out what it was. And I finally said, well, you're a believer, aren't you? And she said, yes. I said, well, then our spirit's connected. And that's what really happened. I don't know why. I've never seen her again. I've never talked to her again. But we connected. I walked by a sister. I don't know why it wasn't the man. I, she may be a little more, more sensitive to her husband or whatever. But we literally can connect to people. And if enough of us can start connecting and living out of the divine mind, living out of the idea of God, we can change this world. It looks like it's just going to go to hell in a handbasket right now, doesn't it? But see, we're looking the wrong way. Well, we need to see people. All people aren't bad. Nobody gets murdered in my neighborhood, you know. And you, we would get, if you watch the news, you think everywhere you go, you've got to be afraid because somebody's going to murder you. But there, there are more, well, I don't like to use the word good, because, but there are more people living more out of their nature than there are that are not. And, you know, it, good is, you know, if we do good things, that's good. I told a guy the other day, there are consequences to, you know, because uh, with God, there's no opposites. There's no good or bad, rich or poor, sick or well with God. And so there's consequences to our bad or our good, right? So if we do things that we call bad, then there's consequences to it. Still but, perception. huh? It's still perception. Yeah. What I call good, you may not. That's right. And then there's confidence, uh, uh, consequences to bad because if you do bad things, you can experience that. If I drive bad, I can experience a wreck, right, or whatever it is. But with Father, there we just we're we're living in the isness of God. 
and we function out of our nature and function out who we are. So the indwelling contact with Father literally is a spiritual nucleus within each one of us, which allows our thoughts to harmonize with our divine mind. And so we allow that we allow this the breath of Father. We you can literally, and I do this quite often, I practice breathing in and breathing out with my oxygen. But I say, Father, I am experiencing breathing in your breath, breathing in, and how I do this, I breathe in the Word of God. I breathe in knowledge, I breathe in wisdom, I, I breathe in truth, I, I study the scripture, I, I translate the words and the names, I bring that revelation in, and then what am I doing right now? I'm breathing it out on you. And so what you should do is, Father, by faith, I receive your breath flowing into my conscious awareness right now. And my subconscious, because our subconscious has the, controls our body, that we have no control over, but also our subconscious has memories in it that we don't know are there, but they hinder us. That's why Paul said, why is it I, when I do good, I do bad? He's, the word evil actually means bad. And he said, because there's sin in my members. Well, what he's saying, there's still the law in my subconscious. I still had this tendency to go back to the law, right? Don't we still? It's been taught to us for so long, we can look at a person and say, wow, man, they are evil. They are bad. No, they're not evil. They've just done something bad. They've done something wrong. And that makes people mad because if somebody kills your child, you want to say that's an evil person. But they're still a son of God. Right? And we don't negate what they did, but I'm not going to judge them and say you deserve to burn in hell because the person's in hell already. They're in torment or they wouldn't have done that. So we are living souls. We are life-giving souls. We breathe in the breath of Father. We breathe out the breath of Father into our world. We are all-powerful when we stay in contact with our Father. When we're not in contact with our Father, when we have no interest with Father, then we're not powerful, although we have that contact, right? And so it's important for us to be thinking daily, is what I'm thinking from Father? Is what I'm doing edifying to the body, edifying to other people. And it's not to condemn you. It's just we want to constantly be saying, Father, everywhere I go, I want to represent you. I want to literally represent who I am. And we're learning that so we can go forth and be I exist in everybody's world around us. Amen? Amen. So I hope that blesses you. Uh, I, it did me. And those of you that uh, have never requested one yet, if you'd like a transcript of this one, you can uh, message me. So if you're a first-time person, ask for that. Message me, and I'll send you this transcript when I get ready to send out. And it, you need to message me. Don't email me or put it on Facebook, but go to Messenger and request it. So God bless you, Sharon. Good to see you with us today. We love you, and we'll see you guys next week.